So, uh, I am going to talk quickly about a couple of topics, thin film diffraction uh, and scattering and in situ diffraction. And these are things that we do commonly here at the synchrotron. And you can generally also do them in lab diffractometers but with, with some limitations because uh, but you should definitely try it. But you'll see the difference uh, as we go. So uh, I'm talking, uh, starting by thin films, the first question would be, what is a thin film? By the way, the talks are in OneDrive. And more and more talks will be shared in the OneDrive folder. So yes, you will have all the slides. Uh, so what is a thin film? And it's similar to Rain Faye's question yesterday when discussing, do you have a powder or a single crystal? It depends how you look at it. In his case, it was the beam size related to the, the single crystal size in the sample. In this case, uh, for, for a thin film, uh, let's suppose that we come with a hard X-rays and we want to investigate this red film here on a blue substrate that we know. We are interested in the film. Uh, in this case where we come with this steep incidence and the beam has a, let's say, a attenuation lens comparable to this black arrow, if we measure the refracted X-rays with the detector here, most of the signal that we measure will come from the substrate and it's, it's not what we are interested in. So this could be our, our powder pattern from in this setup. And the, all the strong peaks come from the substrate, while the thin film uh, information is buried here in the noise in the background. So this is not an effective way to investigate the thin film. This, oh, well, this would be in a, in, a, in a grazing incident. You will see it in the next slide. Uh, so the reason we are doing this is uh, I'll show you that we have thin films everywhere all around. Uh, I'm going to explain the motivation in more details. I'm going to go into details about the attenuation. And I will show uh, quickly different techniques and a few examples. So the f about the motivation uh, for starting thin films is that they are lit almost everywhere. They are in our glasses, in our electronics, in our cars and airplanes, uh, in our tools. Uh, many things that the way we know them today, they wouldn't exist without thin films and knowing, getting to know their structure and the structure property relationship is key to keep developing these new materials to, for, for our way of life. Uh, thin films, they, they have a structure that is st very closely linked to performance as every other material and many times the, the they can be under stress or strain. Uh, and one of the more uh, visible ways of failure is uh, the stress failure, as you can see here. And it would break and stop working. Uh, for, for thin films, we can measure. There's a large variety of techniques. Uh, and they have in common that they, we're usually going to use grazing incidence because we want our x-rays to attenuate mostly in that thin film surface. So we're going to do grazing incidence powder x-ray diffraction, grazing incidence wide angle uh, x-ray scattering, grazing incidence reciprocal phase masks, a small angle x-ray scattering, as I mentioned, reflect, x-ray reflectivity. And with these techniques that, that we're going to choose and pick depending on the sample, we get information about their thickness, roughness, porosity, structure, stress, stru stru texture, def defects, and, and many structural parameters that we that will be interested to understand their properties. And we can apply these techniques to a large variety of films, whether they are single crystal or amorphous or a polycrystalline film, or whether they are nanostructures on a substrate. So back to our initial slide. We concluded this was not a good way to investigate the thin film. 
this one would be better. Coming at a grazing incident, then uh, this, uh, this x-rays will attenuate more, more significantly on the film and less of them in the substrate. So the signal that you record in this detector is increasingly coming from the film the more grazing you go. So we are going to use the grazing incidence. Now, how grazing should we go? Well, we have a certain film of a certain material. And let's say we're going to investigate that with 10 kV because the, or a, a certain energy. Harder x-rays are going to penetrate deeper on a, sub, on a substance. Uh, uh, harder means more energy. L lower energies will penetrate less. This penetration length uh, is characterized by the attenuation length, many times called epsilon. It's the distance over which the X-ray intensity will drop one over E uh, Euler over of the in in incidence intensity. So the attenuation length is a characteristic length that it's important to know when you are going to characterize thin films. And there are tables where you can find them for different materials, depending on the atoms present and how densely packed they are in there. Um, and mu is just the inverse of the attenuation length. And where can you find those attenuation lengths? Well, I, I go to a couple of places. There's this website, Center for X-ray Optics. And there's this free software, XOP, which is a calculator X power. So if you check the first one, this is the website, Center for X-ray Optics. You come here to the database. And they, they have this form where you pick your formula and a density, or if you think they know the density, just leave minus one there. They, they know the basic ones. And you choose your photon energy range and the incidence angle. This is just normal incidence. And when you submit your request, they'll give you a plot. So for example, this was copper. And we can see the absorption edge of copper close to 9 kilo electron volts. And you can also get this on a text file if you want. So you can get attenuation length for your material as a function of energy. And if I had a, like a very thin copper film, well, I know that uh, I don't know, 8 kV, the attenuation length would be about 20, 20 microns and compare that with my film thickness and decide how grazing I want to go. And you can also go grazing enough that you are in total reflection. We're going to get there. So this is what the second alternative I presented for calculating attenuations, attenuation length. XOP is a free software that you can download from the internet, and it has this calculator X power. Um, in X power, you set the parameters, one or more elements, uh, a thickness, a density. It also knows several densities, so because I'm lazy, I don't enter it here. Uh, and then you choose your energy range, and then you can plot the several parameters here. In this case, I plotted mu for copper. Um, yes, that's how you get to know the attenuation length. There you go. So next, how do we measure that? And there are several techniques that we can use. But usually, we all start by aligning the sample. And Adam mentioned this a little bit. You, we want to make sure that the sample is in the center of the beam, and it's parallel to the beam. So to make sure that both conditions are met, we're going to scan the sample up and down and record the, the intensity downstream. And this is the shadow that recorder in the detector as the sample moves up into the beam. So we know that the sample should, we should place it around here in the middle. And to know that it's parallel, we will drop the sample. And then this, again, this is the detector downstream the sample, recording the, the signal that comes. And when none of the edges is, <coughs> is picking up, then we have a maximum, right? So we start inclining on one side, this tip is going to interfere and cut intensity. And then you have a maximum intensity when it's parallel. And then 
the second end, the downstream end starts interfering. So you get this characteristic triangular shape during the alignment, and you want it here. And then you're going to iterate until this doesn't change anymore. And at the end, yes, your sample is in the center of the beam, and it's parallel. So you can start measuring. And uh, there are several options, depending on what, if your sample, for example, is polycrystalline, you can try to do grazing incidence uh, powder diffraction. The same powder diffraction that you that normally is done in theta to theta scans. In this case, you keep the incidence angle fixed at a very grazing angle to be more sensitive to the thin film. And we're just going to sweep the detector, uh, the two theta angle. And in this geometry, it's good to consider a, a few corrections. There are several corrections, including absorption and Lorentz polarization, the atomic scattering factor, and there's also refractions. It's one of the most important ones. So you keep this in mind that the beam is going to refract on the surfaces. And uh, according to this formula, there's going to be a shift on the diffraction peak positions to, to uh, that is more significant the more grazing the angles are. So just keeping that in mind. Oh, something else that you can use grazing incidence diffraction for is to for depth sensitive measurement. Uh, I guess by now you figured it out. The more grazing you go, you are varying the the depths at which you're going to be sensitive to more surface, uh, so closer to the surface. And this, there's going to be a variation also depending on the HKL of your planes and how the, the these spacings, like higher order reflections with the smaller D spacing, have a higher two theta angle, so they will be coming from 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 deeper regions. So that that helps you to have depth sensitivity in the, during your measurements. And I brought one example of that in this case. It's a study of a uranium oxide uh, exposed to air. And they are going to do precisely that, depth sensitive uh, measurements by varying the incidence angle from 8, 5, 4 down to 0.3 degrees. And you can see how the diffraction pattern is changing. The peaks are getting weaker and they're getting broader. This is a zoom of this uh, same figure around the 18 degree to theta region. And you can see how the peak, they get weaker, broader, and there's also a shift. And with this, they conclude that this is due to the presence of heterogeneous micro strain in the surface. And you can see that the peak is shifting to the right. So that means there's a smaller lattice parameter close to the surface. So something different is, going to ha is happening in that uh, uranium oxide surface, and they're getting to more information about that by doing these grazing incidence measurements. This is a second example. In this case, this is about the structure and electrocatalysis of uh, ruthenium platinum zinc films uh, electrodes. And they, this is a mix that undergoes a phase transition depending on the composition between uh, platinum and ruthenium. And they're going to do grazing incidence X-ray diffraction. And yes, flat when, when everything is platinum, that you can see the FCC phase. And the more ruthenium they add, uh, it eventually transforms to hexagonal closed pack. And interestingly here, because it's a thin film, this transition happens at a different composition that it, that it does for the same but bulk material. Because thin films are smaller dimensions and their properties are different from the bulk material. And they come up with phase fractions and a phase diagram for this material uh, in their, their investigation. So that, uh, that was for powder uh, polycrystalline thin film. If we had a single crystalline thin film, and these are materials are more common in microelectronics, 
there is an additional alignment consideration to, to keep in mind here. Oh, and we do measure in, in our diffractometers in a, in a bit of a different configuration. We put our sample uh, like this, and the beam comes this way and scatters well, this way. So this is a zoom. The sample is this little plate right here, which is that one there. And once we get in that configuration, oh, here's another in another diffractometer. We, we took this one away now, but we have a very similar configuration here. We go sideways and scatter up. And we're going to go very grazing on that very thin film to get the information from it. And because we're going this way, and it's a single crystal, the reflections are way more scarce to, and harder to find than for polycrystals. So we need to have an additional alignment consideration because we're going to be looking for our reflections and rotating the sample. So we need this rotation to be uh, in perpendicular to the normal of the sample and not wiggling like this. So to, uh, to make this rotation perfectly in this plane, we are going to align the sample with uh, shining a laser and reflecting on a wall. So we rotate the sample by 90 degrees. And initially, the, the laser reflection spots go in the four different locations because the sample is wiggling how, while it spins. But then you tweak the knobs here until you make that sample normal parallel to the rotation axis. And that's what we want, because then we can keep our incidence angle and rotate the sample, and the incidence angle will stay. So one last alignment step. And now we are ready to measure our single crystal in thin film. And when we measure in the regular configuration, uh, theta to theta, not grazing, most of the signal will come from the substrate. So this uh, strong peak here, like several orders of magnitude stronger than anything else, is coming from the substrate. And, and this is a sample with I, European telluride islands, uh, a few nanometers high, very thin. And the only sign of this island in this, in this measurement is this wavy pattern here. Now, when we go to the grazing incidence, this is now the peak from the island, and this is the peak from the substrate. And now they are comparable, because we are going very grazing, and the, these x-rays, they're barely penetrating the sample, only the I don't know if you've ever heard the evanescent wave goes inside. We are in total reflection at, a, we're at about maybe 0.3 degrees incidence angle. And most, there's a significant fraction of our signal now coming from those nanometer size uh, European telluride islands on the substrate. And, and their signal is comparable to the substrate. And we can see how it changes with different growth times. Uh, it gets more intense. It gets uh, narrower. And it shifts in position. So we get information about the strain state of the nano nanostructures. We get information about their size. We get information about their orientations here. This is a, a reciprocal space map which is when you, <coughs> when you join several line scans. This, this is a line scan, one dimensional scan. Now you can imagine that if you join several of them with different offset angles, you can end up with a two dimensional measurement. But that's a reciprocal space map. And this is a reciprocal space map in the grazing incidence condition. So it's particularly sensitive to the, to the European telluride islands. So it gives information about their orientations and strain and size. And it's all, all these sensitivities thanks to the grazing incidence configuration. Let me see what time is it. Mm -hmm. Oh, I better hurry.
Okay. I don't need to talk about this because Adam already did, right? Uh, he did a pretty good job. Oh, well, this is reflectivity, not sax. Okay. Uh, reflectivity is quite interesting. It's scattering, not diffraction. Uh, sometimes uh, you people call it reflectometry or X-ray XRR reflectivity, and it's always specular. You you do that in grazing incidents, but always specular. Uh, theta and theta, and it gives you information about thicknesses, density, porosity, and the roughness <coughs> of your film. You can have one or more film. <coughs> and here, <coughs> for, if you come at a very grazing angle, theta, smaller than your theta C, theta critic, then all the radiation is going to reflect. That's called total reflection. Uh, this is from a very uh, educative article from Rigaku. So if you go a bit uh, steeper, it's going to be a wave uh, traveling parallel to your surface. And then if you go a bit steeper, there is going to be a refracted uh, rate. So this, th if you measure the, the, the intensity here, you get a curve that is like this. This is total reflection. So one uh, re reflectivity would be incident uh, measure divided by incident intensity. So the maximum is one, unless you're creating photons. And then it will start falling uh, due to the, the refraction and due to scattering and the beams going somewhere else than the detector. And this critical angle here is related to the density of your material. And if, if you neglect absorption, it's roughly around here. So you can get an idea of your density right away. And this is a, another schematic uh, illustrating the Snell law of how the rays are going to re refract in the different interfaces. And then mm. re reflect, refract and reflect, and then they go out. So these rays coming out, they're going to interfere with each other. And that interference can be constructive or destructive. And that can give you characteristic uh, pulsation or uh, intensity bumps in your reflectivity that are very closely related to the thickness of your film by this formula here. So when you, you have one film and you measure reflectivity and you see this, you can immediately calculate the, the thickness of your film. This is a simulation for the, what, what did I do here? Ha, chromium over silicon film. So by varying the, 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 um, the thickness of the film. And this is an actual reflectivity measurement. This time, this is a super lattice, which is a repetition of a uh, bilayer of europium telluride and tin telluride. And it's repeated uh, many times. I don't remember right now. Now, because th there are several periodicities here, and these periodicities will have uh, characteristic oscillations here with different frequencies, and by Measuring those frequencies like from here to here to here. And then there's the small low frequency and the high frequency uh, oscillations that we can see. We can get the different periodicities. For example, the, the 83 angstroms <coughs> uh, corresponds to the super lattice period, uh, like one layer of European telluride and one of thin telluride. And the <clears throat> the very broad one here corresponds to the whole super lattice thickness. So it's thicker here, so it, it, the, you, there will be high frequency oscillations here. It's reversed, like many things here in X-ray diffraction. You need you think reversed. <laughs> and there's also uh, information about the roughness in the reflectivity. And you can figure that the more rough your film is, the faster the intensity the fall will be. And yet that's exactly what happens. Rougher films uh, will reflect less for higher and higher angles. And if you, as I get the same, the 100 angstrom chromium layer, and I 
simulate different roughness. Increasing roughness are going to wash out those oscillations until they're completely destroyed. So a very rough film won't give a very meaningful reflectivity. Not, not much information there. Yes? Um, what energy of x-rays were you using for this? I, this is a simulation. I probably use 8 or 10 kV. OK. Because uh, at my company, we do almost the exact same thing as this. We just take it a step farther. And we use really soft x-rays for it. OK. So we don't have to have such oh. grazing instruments. Okay. Okay, good. Yes, so, okay. oops, I'm very hurry. Okay, and something else to take into account is because you are such grazing angles. Yes. Uh, did you have the last slide uh, before, or the previous slide before? Uh, so, oh no, oh, yeah, the previous one. So the uh, interlayer is Yes. Yeah, very likely. Yes. I would. I haven't tried, but it sounds like yes. Okay, we're getting close to the snack time, right? I better hurry. Okay, so. You're going very grazing, so you're probably spilling being up and down, something to consider. You are losing intensity that you need to correct for. And you're going to fit. There are several programs to fit, and of course, Jesus is one of the best. And we are ready to move on to the in situ, because Adam already talked about Jesus. Yes, he talked about sacks, and when you go grazing incidents, that is Jesus. And then you're sensitive to very superficial fissures in your sampling. So we're going to skip over this. Yeah, he, he explained this very nicely. And this is the same figure I put here. Very similar example. Oh, advertisement about our group. <clears throat> you're going to hear this over and over. We have just about everything that you will need. <laughs> All the techniques that we're going to talk around here, three beamlines, broad energy range, and I will keep talking about this in the, in the next talk. So we have several end stations where we can do X-ray diffraction, grazing incident diffraction. Oops, same example. This is going to come again in more detail in the, in the in-situ talk, because this is our IBM end station. And the in-situ talk is about to start now. Uh, right after we get the conclusions from the thinking. Ah, so if you have a sample, uh, XRD is one of the first things to try if you want to know about the structure. And if it's a very thin film, you probably want to try the grazing incidence geometry. It will tell you about the structure and defect and thickness and roughness and uh, many more features that will help you understand what's going on with it. Uh, for the reading, the slides are in the drive, and this is the in-situ diffraction. Okay, and why do we want to do in-situ experiments? Well, because real materials, they operate either under, under real conditions. Sometimes it's high temperature or high pressure or electric current. What else? Hmm. Hazardous gas. This is the catalyst. It's going to be both hazardous gas and high temperature. So we want to replicate that. If it's a battery, it's probably flowing current and it's also heating up. So we want to test the properties of the materials under real working conditions. And that will teach us more realistic uh, a picture about their properties and structure. So we're going to do that by using different sample environments. And because we have such humongous stations, we can have and, and broad energy range that and high energies that can go through anything, considering the attenuation. Uh, then we we can put many different sample environments here in the synchrotron, from furnaces to cryostats to battery cyclers, because now everybody wants to research batteries. And 
is another furnace, cryo stream, and we have we have even investigated in, made concrete and cement in situ, uh, investigating their how how it dries and it, the, the phases evolve during the concrete drying there, and we can investigate phase transitions if we do temperature dependent measurements. We can apply this to microelectronics, batteries, solar cells. Uh, we have we can do mechanical testing in situ and uh, the capabilities will go improving and changing and we usually listen to what our users are interested in. and many times not restricted to our setups but many times the users bring their own setups that are specific to their research interests and we help them develop those setups if they need help to make sure they are compatible with our station and you will see for examples here of those uh, uh, setups brought by our users and they are it's a large variety and those are perfect for this specific research. This is an example of a phase transition in our powder diffraction station. This is our IBM station and it can do x-ray diffraction during rapid thermal annealing up to about a thousand degrees C. Uh, all the while, while uh, under ultra high purity, either nitrogen or helium, and it's all the while is measuring uh, resistance with a four point probe, and it has a, and you can also get the roughness of that film, and what's it's probably going to get rougher or change when you heat it up to a really hot. So yes, and this is a, the station. I actually have a video of them. So these are the 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 photodiodes here, laser for the roughness probe, the chamber. Let's see the video will be more explicit. This is for the sample holder and the sample size. And there is a click here. And we really need to make a new video because it's gonna say future and it's very present. Maybe it takes two clicks or three clicks. Oh, four clicks. Maybe it's just slow. Oh, oh well. But maybe it doesn't want to run. Oh, sorry. Okay. Well, the bottom line is that this station is completely automated, and the users run it from New York most of the time. They just mail us the samples. We mount the samples. There's a robot. There's a visual interface where they can set up a long sequence. Oh, ha, <laughs> ha. <laughs> there's a video. OK, so there are four sample trays. This is the IBM team. As I said, this is in the lower energy Wheeler beamline. Adam is the contact person who is our IBM friend. There's the sample here on the copper block. It's water cooled because otherwise it would melt. It's very noisy. Uh, it, this is a pneumatic system that can open the, the chamber to remove the sample uh, or put it back. That's the robot's going to grab a sample. And it's going to put it close to a sensor to make sure he actually has a sample and um, put it here. Most of the time he's right, he has a sample. And now the pneumatic system is gonna come and slide the flange back inside. It's a lock here that you see, plug. so it's locked and off here and now it can slide back out. And now the chamber is closed. So now we can make vacuum and put our ultra high purity atmosphere and start the experiments, the thermal annealing. And this is useful to investigate the uh, stability of these very thin films for microelectronics and how reversible the, the changes are when you ramp the temperature up and down. And this helps them with uh, to screen uh, literally thousands of samples because they can put a long sequence of measurements and the four trays with 24 samples each. Okay, so yes, and this is one example that Adam presented, and this is the ruthenium silicide uh, 
metal nitride bar barrier layers, and they are doing uh, rapid thermal annealings to find out the activation temperatures and the different phases and when it's going to fail or not. And they can they also apply this to a more, more nickel silicide. And you can see how many phase transitions are going on here. And at the same time, the resistance is changing, the roughness is changing. So this gives them feedback about uh, the growth conditions, how they can get better nucleation, get more film stability, and better uh, uh, interfaces, smooth interfaces. This is another example of uh, amorphous memory uh, material that undergoes a crystalline transition. So this is amorphous and this is crystalline. And at the same time, there is a strong change in resistivity. Remember, there is a resistance probe in there. And this, is, this has applications for uh, is a memory, how is it called? Uh, phase change memory technology. And I'm going to rush through the examples now. We have lots of users doing battery experiments. And this is our battery cycler. And the high energy goes through real batteries. So we can investigate how the anode and cathode of those batteries are changing when you cycle them up and down. And, and this is important because you want a battery that lasts forever. You can cycle many times. It works at minus 30. Uh, uh, they heat, they heat up in there, so, so there's, there's studies of the temperature by doing 3D mapping of the, 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 in the guts of the battery, and with the lattice parameter, the, you can get the strain and then the temperature. We have uh, a user that brings his own battery setup. This is Mike Fleshauer there from Alberta. And he has wonderful measurements. These ones in particular are with his home diffractometer, but he has measured here, and he will soon have amazing results here. Oh, this is another user from the university. This one, Tim Kelly, he investigates solar cells. And in this case, these are perovskite solar cells. He developed in his group this chamber here. And the chamber has uh, control of the uh, humidity, it has temperature control, and it has uh, control of the light. They have a, a lamp that's the artificial sun. And with all those things in, in the beam line, uh, he can investigate how this material structure is going to change with time, with the humidity, with the temperature, and he can investigate the degradation and eventual failure of these materials. Because the, the real cells are going to uh, operate in a real world where it's raining and hot and it's then cold. And even we want to come up with better materials that last longer. So these in situ developments, uh, uh, sometimes very specific for different research, they give the, the group lots of information about uh, their material and where to go, how to change it. So we've seen experiments about batteries. We have seen experiments about perovskite. We, this is an example about uh, breakaway of stainless steel and, uh, and oxidation. It, the, the stainless steel is only stainless because there's chromium oxide in the surface protecting it from oxidizing. Now, when subject to thermal treatments and uh, uh, corrosive atmosphere eventually it's going to break. And uh, we can see those phase transitions in situ. And uh, in this work, they, they concluded that the problem here is that the chromium layer that was protecting the stainless steel is, is running out of chromium. Things are moving around. The phases are changing. Iron is going up. Chromium is going down. And before you know, there is no more protective chromium oxide on the surface, and your stainless steel is corroding. So we can do this on site. And there, there are many more examples in situ. I will only quickly show. This is a user setup, a stress rig for tiny, tiny samples. 
that this is the size of a, a tuny. There are stress rigs uh, that are medium size. This is like a small fridge, and this there are stress rigs that are gigantic. All depends on your application and how much money you have. <laughs> and then uh, you can apply them to understand phase changes on their uh, mechanical stress and temperature. And you can see here how uh, austenite decomposes into martensite, epsilon, and alpha, and so on. So the, the number of examples for in situ experiments is uh, very large. and I can not pretend to present here anything complete. You have many more slides in one drive. I guess the bottom line is that it's a way more realistic way to learn about your sample. Let's say it's a catalyst. You need the high temperature and the hazardous gas, and it's going to operate, and it's going to phases are going to change. It might degrade with time. You, you want to learn about that. We can also do high pressure experiments. So uh, I guess the sky is the limit. So keep that into consideration. There's way more that you can do once you add the in situ environment to your experiment. The degrees of freedoms multiply. So with that, please, uh, I will finish the talk. And if you have any questions. No question. Yes. Oh, sure. Um, so for the IBM and station, yes. that's exclusively for SAS, correct? Like oh, the, the it does X-ray diffraction. Okay. So those were diffraction patterns, and at the same time, you can control the temperature, you can measure the resistance of the surface, and you can measure the roughness. And all that in ultra high purity gases, because if it was just atmosphere at high temperature, probably the film would oxide, will oxidize. So then maybe when they run it under argon or? Helium or nitrogen, what is more common? Maybe. Helium, uh, also forming gas too. For, oh, yeah. But the, so it operates at about, I think it's 18 BTU for the whole thing. And the angular range that they measure is probably between 5 and 40 degrees. So it's, it's not actually SAC, it's just the allocation to x ray diffraction. It's open to general users. It just happens to be that they use it almost exclusively. <laughs> we have had a couple of users that have tried, and, and yes, if you come up with ideas, we have the. We will help you, and he, they will help you too. And that's why I have this promotional slide here to illustrate how the size of your sample should be. But yeah. Yes. Um, have you ever done, or have you ever had anyone try to investigate like semiconductor structures like RAM or, or like what? Or, like RAM, random access memory, or anything like trying to figure out like different, like the spacing, uh, like the pitch and, and things like that of semiconductors. I don't think we have had it. Uh, Sometimes I've seen like so we don't when we get samples from companies we don't know what they are. Sometimes I've seen they are actually like integrated circuits mm -hmm. on there. I don't know what they. In principle, it, yeah. If you move the sample. Uh, on your beam, you can get spatial information mm -hmm. with the resolution about the size of your beam. Mm -hmm. And we do have stages uh, to put a large sample, and the idea is to measure in different spots. That, that's yeah. enough. Well, well, what we do <laughs> is we have soft x rays and we get a diffraction pattern mm -hmm. in the detector. Mm -hmm. And we have certain algorithms we can use to determine, you know, because we know what the structure should look like to regress on that and to get things like the pitch and the roughness and all, mm -hmm. lots of different parameters like the height. And they're usually very complex three-dimensional applications. So, okay. Yeah. Well, we can talk more if you want. Yes. Mm -hmm. There are many applications. More questions?
Yes. Yeah, um, the signature light is polarized. So it yes. doesn't matter when you do your transmits if your surface is parallel to the E-field versus perpendicular to the E-field. I was looking about that a long time ago. I don't remember. We, we usually measure in the same plane. Uh, it does it does matter, yes. If th that's why we measure in this plane and, and not sideways. But, I mean, you can measure sideways, but eventually you you run out of intensity because the projection of your electric field will die at ninety degrees sideways, while in the incoming plane you you don't have that problem. This is the electric field, electromagnetic field of the light coming. Yeah, it's polarized. Thank so, you yeah. Could, the, if you could uh, rotate your sample from out, could you see whether there were any emissions yes. like that maybe interesting? You can rotate your sample as much as you can. Yeah. 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 You can do that. There is something about that, but I read about that a long time ago. I don't remember, sorry. But any more questions or everybody just want to go to snack? You know where to find me. Thank you. We're going to break for quick snacks. Let's see what time is it. What time is it? It's, oh, OK. What about, what about a 10 minute break? And uh, we can be back at. 11, okay?